I'm Dean. I'm the dad. I'm Laura. I'm the mom. And I'm Crystal. And I'm the daughter. And together we are Family, Family Plot. Plot. Very nice. Very nice. I like that a lot. How is everyone today? It's quite warm here in our home state of Missouri. I'm a little sweaty. <clears throat> little well, you know, you always are when you're around me anyway, so... <laughs> Thank you, Krista, for the rim shot. That was nice. Uh, all right, let's get the uh, housekeeping out of the way. Uh, first of all, if you'd like to help us out, a few ways you can do that. One, there's Patreon. Now, there's three different Patreon groups you can join. T Team Podcast. Team Bunny. Or Team Electric Bell. And it doesn't really matter which one you donate to, because it all goes the same place to feed the bunny and to pay the electric, electric bill. bill. <laughs> so... Uh, if you can't do a monthly donation, that's okay. Uh, you can do a one-time donation through Buy Me a Coffee, uh, any whole dollar amount there. Uh, and if you can't do that, we've never had a lot of money here. So, uh, yeah, if you want to still help out, here's an easy way to do it that doesn't cost you anything. If you enjoy the show, share it on social media. If not, keep it, keep it to yourself. yourself. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Well, at least you got in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> we, we appreciate her deciding to join in with us. It's always nice when we have our Krista. Now, today, we visit 1940s Japan. Uh, we will do a brief bit of history on World War II. time machine called Google. Well, uh, actually, we stole the Wayback Machine. That's my fiction anyway. You stole the Wayback Machine. We stole Google. Uh, we will do a brief bit of history on World War II, uh, what brought the Japanese into the conflict, and then we're going to look at three men who continued fighting long after the war had ended. We get unforgivingly historical in today's episode of the Family Plot Podcast. But first... But first, as always, Krista has a corner. <laughs> It's not just any corner, it's Krista's Corner! Hey Krista! Hello! What's going on in your corner this week? Well? Other than the fact that you are covered in ink. Yeah, I am very much covered in ink. I drew all over myself today. That was super fun. Um, you know, whatever. You're not hurting anybody and I'm you're not expressing yourself. You're not hurting yourself specifically, absolutely. I love it. So, what do you have to tell us about it going on in your corner this week, Chris? Well, first of all, um, uh, we're not at all sponsored by by them, but I would like to thank my mom's friend, Jennifer. I don't know if she's listening to this, but I know she's planning on listening to some of the episodes. Absolutely, and Jennifer is a listener, listener and, and we love to her. Starlight, because that was an amazing experience, and I, I want to go there again at some point. I know it's expensive. I don't know. I loved the. I loved the show. Like you, that was such a good. So what'd you see? Display. We saw a uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, mm -hmm. and I'm not one to be like uh, religious, but this wasn't like at all like telling you to be religious. It was more like telling you the story, some of the story of what has happened to Jesus Christ in music and play, and that makes me really like pumped up and excited. And Starlight did a really great job of like 
the actors, oh my god, the voices from the movie, the actors, like, those vocals were amazing, they also had quite good representation, they had all sorts of different people there, I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> now see, most of the time I've seen Jesus Christ Superstar, it's been set in the 60s, kinda, and they've sort of redone it, but... So, but this was actually set with Jesus. So, no, this was, I mean, this, it was kind of, it, it was very, lots of, like, rusted looking metal and very, like, what is that type of setup, like, very metal and angular and almost like... Post-apocalyptian? Kind of that. It yeah. could definitely be conserved. There were a bunch of crosses. It was, and it was very like rustic metal. Yeah, it was very like I B metals and you know, like rung ladder stairs and big crosses made out of metal. It was it was and then of course like almost like neon lights in the places where they lit things up. So Oh yeah, that was so good. Some of the people brought their children. I was like, yeah. "You brought your child? Okay." Well, and a lot of the kids that I saw that were there were really into it. So they were just like, "Bro, this is cool." <laughs> but um, no, that was really good, and I I definitely would recommend going to see like a couple of the shows because it was really that was really nice. Starlight Amphitheater in Kansas City, Missouri. Yes. Yeah, that was. So we appreciated you. We appreciated the performance that they put on, and of course, we appreciated Jennifer. We appreciate for Jennifer us. for taking us because that that was just overall a nice thing to do. I'm not gonna say my reason for thanking you besides the fact that you took us and you didn't. You hardly let us pay you back. Um, she didn't pay her back. I bought her a drink. That was so funny. She was wonderful. She is. She's an amazing person. Um, yes. We appreciate her. Um. Besides all that, though, again, thank you for taking us to that experience. Thank you for the experience, Starlight Theater. Um, I am going to be talking about in specific today. Uh, prehistoric animals. Cool. I have a couple favorite prehistoric animals that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh huh. So we have the dodo bird, which is one of my actual favorites. And you know, I, I do find dodo birds very interesting. Cool. Seeing as they like. I don't know how to explain it, but they're not as colorful as people make them out to be, or anything. But, like, they're big birds, mm -hmm. big boys, mm -hmm. who literally emol, get launch. Do you know why there are no more dodo birds? No, they all died because they were beaten to death by Dutch sailors. Yeah, the fact that the last few were beaten to death by Dutch sailors is a matter of public record. And to be fair, it might not be entirely true. I've heard some people... Uh, say that it isn't for one reason or another, but I've heard a lot more say, yeah, it was Dutch sailors beating them to death. But and you know it was Dutch sailors. Maybe it was Italian sailors. We don't know. I, I don't know for it's sure. I don't know for sure. All I'm going to say is that... Viking sailors? Could, I don't know. Humans are not known for their kindness. That is quite true, sir. I mean, you know, if, if we're we're going to go after people who have uh, genocided a species, we also have to talk to the Americans because 
uh, thanks to us, there are no more passenger pigeons. And no more of the original bison that roamed the prairies. I thought we still had bison. We do have bison, but not the original ones that the American Indians hunted for their... Those were much larger than the ones that we have. The ones that we still have are another okay. genus of bison. But the original bisons that roamed the prairies that that uh, American Indians... Um, it sounds like a, a runaway train on legs, almost. I mean, they, they were big. Yeah, I believe so. I, I may be misremembering that. Don't quote me on that. I'm going to Google it, but I feel like that's a thing. Anyway, Krista, I interrupted. I'm sorry. Tell me, tell me more about the dodo, because it was one of your favorite prehistoric creatures. It is one of my favorite prehistoric creatures. Um, there's also more, though. There's not just that. There's also... Um, I love, love saber-toothed tigers. I like Diego on Ice Age. Does that count? Um, he is a saber tooth tiger, but he's not necessarily my favorite saber tooth tiger. Um, there's another one. There's like another couple that I really like that I can't remember any of the names of right now because they're like. What well, you think for a minute, I've got something to cover the time while you're thinking. Uh, I was I was playing earlier, I was playing uh, DC Universe Online, and I was in one of my characters' base. And in the base there, I've got a statue of a woolly mammoth. And Lexi saw it, and she goes, you have an elephant in your base? And I had to try to explain to her what a woolly mammoth was. I don't know if I succeeded, but yeah. Okay, so I want to correct my misinformation. <clears throat> One of the most endearing symbols of the early Western culture in the United States, and this is from Environment Society, it looks like. Of early Western culture in the United States is the bison. It is estimated that around 30 to 50 million buffalo roamed the Great Plains at the beginning of the 19th century. However, in an increasingly consumerist society during the 19th century, bisons were hunted to the brink of extinction by frontier whites. Commodities, mainly bison hides for jackets and leather, were extremely popular, profitable, and fashionable back in the eastern regions of the United States. By 1902, fewer than 100 wild buffalo roamed the Great Plains. In 1905, the American Bison Society was founded and the wild population has gradually grown into the stable level of around 30,000 wild bison today. From 30 to 50 million down to less than a hundred. You know, that again, uh, you know, like I said, violence kind of defines humanity. All right. Same to Tiger. Yes. The Saber Tooth Tiger is one of, another one of my favorites. And then. I also do like woolly mammoths, but they're not one of my favorite. I'm kind of scared because, like, people are saying that they're trying to bring back some of the old, like, prehistoric animals. I'm like, well, you know that's not the best idea with the climate, right? With how our climate already is. <laughs> well, okay, but in the case of, like, the mammoths, I don't think what they're going to be bringing back is purely mammoths. They have some of the DNA, and then the closest relative we got is the Indian elephant. So what we bring back is going to be like a crossbreed of the two, almost. Still pretty dangerous. You don't want to bring big red brain new animals into the world, and they could go extinct all over again because of the freaking 
constant weather change. You want to fix on the you want to fix the environment before you fix new animals. And then the only other things I know they're working on are like the thylacine, which if they brought back the Tasmanian tiger, that would make me happy. <laughs> oh yeah, that was another one. I love the Tasmanian tiger. They look so cool. And like apparently, I thought recently that I found like an article on them being seen again, but also killed off again. I don't know. It, it, there is some debate over whether thylacines still exist. Uh, we might, we we have, uh, um, and certainly Josh Gates has. So, and uh, what what we found out is there are some blurry photos out there. Uh, so we may have some uh, a a remnant population of thylacines, but we don't have any proof of that. Right. Like, so many people are just like, oh, they're still here, and I'm just like, hey, where's your proof? <laughs> where's your proof, boo? They could have died a long time. <laughs> oh, that's stupid. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, Tasmanian tigers, and then there's also an old duck that, like, yeah, a prehistoric duck that doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Um, I can't remember why it doesn't exist anymore, but I... Disney kidnapped it and made it work for him, and now we call him Donald. Uh, I see how it is. That's a nice way to, uh... I see how it is. For the record, Disney didn't kidnap anything. I was just trying to cover time so Krista could find her prehistoric duck. Find her prehistoric duck. Actually, the prehistoric duck moved to Hollywood. It was the choreographer on Happy Feet. Howard. Howard didn't dance. But Happy Feet, you've got all these penguins dancing and... They're not ducks, they're penguins! But it makes the joke funnier, no, see? No, it doesn't. I don't agree. I think that Howard... Okay, do you want us to come back to your prehistoric duck? Did you find your prehistoric duck? No, I'm just waiting for y'all to, uh... Hush our face? Okay. <laughs> no. I'm... I'm being stupid on Snapchat. Or not on Snapchat. Twitter. Okay, so in other words, we can go on. You're done. Yeah. I just wanted to talk a little bit about prehistoric birds. Okay, cool. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for sharing. We yeah. appreciate it. I gave a guy in traffic the prehistoric bird the other day. No, honey. You're old. You're not prehistoric. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the other dude was prehistoric. Oh, I guess possibly. Like, the guy in traffic was oh, prehistoric. Right? Could be. Could be. All right. Yeah. So, as I said... Uh, to get to this week's topic is these three holdouts. We have to cover a little of World War II. Now, I need to say right off the top, this is a very rough overview, and we are leaving out a lot. There are whole podcasts devoted to the history of World War II. So, if you stuff on YouTube, and then there's also history classes. Yes, true. So, if you would like to know more, it is definitely out there. But I, I just, what we're doing is just dropping out very large chunks of information uh, that is by no means complete. It's a very rough summary we're doing. So, uh, if we want to figure out the underlying cause of World War II, we have to peek at least a little bit into World War I. Uh, the end of the First World War saw Germany... Germany 
journey. Uh, Germany heavily punished. Its economy was wrecked. Its national pride was virtually gone. The country was in rough shape. Uh, introduced into this mix was a young anti-Semite named Hitler. Uh, Adolf Hitler uh, began to rally national pride uh, through the Nazi party, uh, and he began to point at a possible reason German was suffering. The Jews. Uh, it is, and this is a parenthetical, but I have to say it, it is unfortunately and infuriatingly common that when things begin to go bad for a country, that some group gets scapegoated. Sometimes, even multiple groups. Uh, Germany, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, I don't want to be political, but y you can see that right now in this country, which is part of what makes me so sad. Listen, a lot of stuff is going on in a lot of places, and this isn't the podcast to talk about it, and this isn't po the podcast to talk about the emotions on it, but, you know, if uh, if y'all want to listen to somebody's opinion, um, you can look at said podcasts that are better for that topic, and, you know, others are allowed to have their own political stances, and we're not saying they're not. We're not saying any of them are wrong. We just all have our own opinions. But I think that we should we should put set aside some of our opinions and try to work on everyone as everything as a whole. We can decide what to do with people after the economy and the environment is better. I think that personally. But go on. <laughs> So, uh, now, Germany began to rebuild its military, even though they weren't supposed to. Uh, according to many historians, this was partly due to the policies of British Prime Minister at the time, Neville, peace in our times, Chamberlain. Uh, Neville was ignoring signs of German aggression and even signed a treaty ceding land to Germany in the hopes that appeasement would keep them from going to war. And I will say that while I liked his successor, uh, you know, the, the famous Winston Churchill, much better, Neville did what he thought was best. And he thought if he appeased the Nazis, they wouldn't go to war. He was wrong about that, but that's what he thought. Uh, and, and Neville did, was the one to actually declare war in Germany on behalf of England, not personally. It's not like he... He was like, I've had it with the Germans. I'm going to go get them all. No, uh, no. He, he declared on behalf of the England. Um, and France did the same uh, when Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. Um, Italy, around this same time, invaded Ethiopia. And thus, the two countries became allies in this mutual pact of aggression. Meanwhile, Japan, which had overall become more military, sought to conquer China. So these countries, which were already being aggressive, banded together in order to conquer at least a wide swath of the world, if not all of it. Now, one of the, one of the things uh, about uh, that is so interesting to me is like the Japanese worldview and the Nazi worldview would not have ever let them, like when they started coming into contact, there would have been fighting. They, 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 those mindsets would, but while they were on different sides of the planet, they got along just fine. It's easy to get along when you're not ever seeing one another. So. The end of the war and the Japanese mindset in World War II. So if we look more into the mindset of the Japanese people at the time, they saw themselves as blessed by the jo gods. Because, you know, why wouldn't you if you were Japanese? And I guess you would kind of have to see yourself as blessed by the gods if you're a 
country the size of Japan taking on a country the size of China. I mean, there's, there's a little bit of a, what, what would you call that, maybe overcompensation? or uh, I would just say the Japanese are darn feisty, some of them. They are super feisty, absolutely, amazing. <laughs> That's definitely a go-getter kind of attitude, for sure. <laughs> David and Goliath. Oh, goodness. So, they did see themselves as blessed by the gods, if not actually chosen by them. They firmly wanted to take over China. They wanted to be a power in the Pacific, and since America had declared an oil embargo against them, and oil was a resource that they desperately needed, they at first attempted to negotiate with them. However, since the Americans insisted upon leaving China and signing non-aggression pacts with their Pacific neighbors, the Japanese decided to conquer European holdings in Asia to use as a shield wall, allowing them to get the resources they needed in Asia. In addition to this, there was still very much the idea of the samurai among the military. The idea that the Japanese lived on a code of honor and would rather die than surrender. Mind you, this code of honor seemed in no way to apply to the people they were fighting. This, in, this is in some part why Japan did not surrender even when it was facing America by itself. Americans dropped a devastating bomb on Tokyo, which was one of the first times the Japanese populace felt the effects of war. Even after this, the Japanese fought still. Based upon this idea, Harry Truman felt that while they could have poured millions of troops into, Japan, into invading Japan, there would be less overall loss of life by dropping two atomic bombs that they named the horrific names. <laughs> you did that on purpose. Yes, yes I did, because I know how much you hate that. Of Batman, Y, Y, and Little Boy on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So it is this never surrender mindset we have to consider as we look into these Japanese holdouts who continued fighting long after Japan surrendered. Yes, I wrote that uh, because uh, I know how much you hate those the nicknames for those bombs. Uh, also, uh, something I, I because I I also wrote it. I, I just. Uh, when I say the code of honor seemed in no way to apply to the people they were fighting, the Japanese people were not kind to the people they conquered. Uh, uh, in matter of fact, uh, in some ways, they were actually pretty vile. So this code of honor they had about treating people a certain way only seemed to apply to other Japanese, sure. not to their opponents. That's sort of what I was trying to get right. at. Right. Absolutely. And before we go any further, because now we've Good sort of set, we've sort of set the scene uh, for what we're going to talk about. Now is time for a word from our sponsors. Hey, Dad. Yes, Krista. I feel sponsored. Yes. Krista, did you just realize how big Mom's other next part was? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I wasn't fully paying attention when I saw it on my phone, but... So, uh, I should point out, we're covering these guys in the order that they surrendered, basically. Good to know. Um, so, our first holdout is Shoichi Yokoi. Uh, Shoichi Yokoi was born in Saori, and for the Japanese who listen, I am sorry for all my mispronunciations. Uh, that's in Aichi Prefecture in Japan on March 31st, 1915. 
He was an apprentice tailor until he was conscripted in 1941. Uh, initially, he was sent to Manchukuo, uh, attached to the 29th uh, Infantry Division. Uh, now, for those of you who don't recognize the name Manchukuo, it is the name uh, of the Chinese area, Manchuria, while it was under occupation by the Jap- Japanese. Because <clears throat> apparently Japanese feel if they conquer it, they can rename it. Anyway, he served there until February of 1943 when he was transferred to the 38th Regiment in the Mariana Islands, uh, and he arrived in Guam. I love Guam, just I don't know anything about it other than that name is fun to say. You want some Guam? What's on your shoe? I got some Guam. Uh, In 1944, when America took the island in the Battle of Guam, he went into hiding. He and nine other soldiers lived in hiding until seven of the other men moved away. Which, I, I, the question I have there is, why did these other sen- seven move away? Did they decide these three were jerks? <laughs> or did they decide that, you know, uh, the Americans are getting way too close. We're going to go over to a different part of the island. And everybody else was just like, no, uh, we're going to stay here. I don't know. I don't know why they they left, but and and I couldn't find out what happened to any of them. So I'm going to guess they either died uh, hiding out, or they were captured and returned home in a somewhat timely fashion. Because at this point, uh, we're into the the war is over, and they've been hiding. For years now. Now, he and the the remaining two men would unite from time to time until they were killed in a flood. So it was just him for the longest time. He, uh, He subsisted on a diet of wild nuts, mangoes, papayas, shrimp, snails, frogs, and rats. Yummy. Krista, what's the matter? You hungry? <laughs> no! I'm sorry to be rude, but are you stupid? <laughs> hey. Hey. I think Bear Girls tells people that rats could eat. Just saying. And I sort of feel about it like, uh, uh, Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction, sewer rat may taste like pumpkin pie, but I'll never know because I'll never Stop. eat the filthy thing. Stop. There you go. You know that you've about made our daughter lose our dinner. Go ahead. Now, he also used native plants to make bedding, clothes, and other implements that he kept hidden in his cave. And I was thinking about that because, like in comedy, there's this thing. That you take what you know and you build on it. And and if you look at this and remember, he was a tailor from the age of 15 to well, he, an appra- a tailor's apprentice. That makes sense. And it's no wonder he did this. He knew how. He The, the sewing of things was a thing he could do. Yeah, sure. Now, he was hunting at night, as was his custom, when he encountered two men from the village of Talafofo who were checking shrimp traps. The two men assumed he was a villager like themselves, but he felt he was in danger of being killed and so attacked the two men. They managed to subdue him and they carried him out of the jungle. That was nice of them. Yeah. Uh, Shoichi expected the, the men to kill him, so he was very surprised when they fed him hot soup at their house before authorities picked him up and conveyed him to the Guam Memorial Hospital. They declared him mostly healthy, only slightly anemic due to to a lack of salt in his diet. Uh, He received the first haircut he had received in 28 years, and eventually was brought home to Japan. This was in January of 1972. 
He had known the war was over since 1952, but according to him, Japanese soldiers were taught to accept death before the dishonor of capture. In March, he was returned home, where his first recorded words were, It is with much embarrassment I return home. This became a popular saying in Japan long afterwards. Uh, he toured Japan in a quick media tour where he was welcomed home, welcomed home as a hero. He then returned to rural Aichi Prefecture. He married. He became a popular television personality. In fact, I, I didn't realize it, but I was right, watching a very old episode of Iron Chef, the original Japanese show, and he was on it. He was one of the guys eating. Wow. So, yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, while he... And, and, and he became a, a, an advocate of simple living as well, which, considering how long he lived on frogs and fruit, eh, okay, simple living, you, you got it. Sure. Add some salt in there, and he, he could have stayed forever. Uh, but while he never met the emperor, he visited the imperial palace saying, Your majesties, I have returned home. I deeply regret that I could not serve you well. The world has certainly changed, but my, determiner, determ, but my determination, I was determined to say that word, uh, to serve you will never change. Eventually, he passed a heart attack at the age of 82 in 1997. He was buried in a Nagoya cemetery under a headstone that had been commissioned by his mother when he was initially declared dead by the military back in 1955. Before his death, he was given $300 U.S. in back pay by the military and a small pension. He is still revered by many Japanese today. Wow. And... Yeah, well, of the three, he's kind of my favorite. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about our next very dedicated individual. Next, we're going to talk about Hiru Onada. Hiru? Or Hiru? Hiru Onada? Hiru Onada. That sounds better. Hiru Onada, born March 19th, 1922. He was born in Kamikawa Village in the Keiso District, located in the Wakayama Prefecture. I didn't know the Japanese liked Keiso. Sure. When he was... And again, to piggyback off of what Dean said, obviously, my... Pronunciation is going to be horrible, and I apologize. I'm doing my very best here. <laughs> my, even with my love of anime, I still can't. Do very well sounding out my Japanese words. I apologize. Now, you, you're probably right. It, it is probably queso. It's just... I never realized that until... Queso, kaiso, maybe? maybe kaiso, or ki... Kaiso? Because, like, isn't acai a Japanese word? Acai, I think? No. I don't know. No. Anyway, when he was 17 years old, he went to work for the Taja Yoko training, co training Company in Wuhan, China. When he was 18, he enlisted in the Imperial Japanese Army. Onada trained as an intelligence officer in the commando class of the Nakano, Nakano School. On December 6, 1944, he was sent to Lubang Island in the Philippines. He was ordered to do all he could to hamper the enemy, including destroying the airstrip and the pier. He was also ordered that he was under no circumstances to surrender or take his own life. When he got to Lubang, he joined up with forces that were already on the island. 
these men outranked him and prevented him from destroying either the airfield or the pier. Things that made it easier for the Allied forces to take the island when they landed on February 28, 1945. A short time after they landed, Onada, who had been promoted to lieutenant, addressed the three remaining men in his unit and ordered them into the hills. From there, the men hid out in the mountains and carried out guerrilla attacks. It is Bill believed that he wrote. He, what? How did you say it, Krista? Hero. Hero. Hero and his men killed over thirty Filipino civilians. The first inkling that they, the first inkling they had that the war might be over was late in 1945. Another cell of surviving soldiers had killed a cow, and the locals had left a leaflet on the, at the site that read, The war ended on 15th August, come down from the mountains. Onada examined the leaflet with his men and determined incorrectly it had to be fake. If the war was over, they reasoned, they would not be, they would not have been fired upon. Towards the end of 1945, leaflets, leaflets were airdropped onto the area with a surrender order from General Tomiyuki, Tomiyaki, Yamashiti, Yamashita, I believe. Yamashita of the 14th Area Army. Onada and his men studied the leaflet to determine if it was genuine and believed, yet again, incorrectly, that it was not. One of the four soldiers walked away from the others and lived on his own towards the end of 1949. He surrendered to the Philippine authorities several months later after living on his own. The other three men became even more cautious. In 1952, letters and pictures from the men's families were dropped into the region, but they thought that this was a trick. In 1954, another of Anana's men was killed after getting in a shootout with locals who had formed a search party, who had formed a search party to find the three men. Down to two, the pair remained cautious. As part of their guerrilla activities, the two men were setting fire to rice gathered by local farmers in October of 72. At this point, Anada's last subordinate was shot and killed by local police. Anada was alone at that point. And Anada carried on by himself until on February 20th, 1974, he met Norio Suzuki, a man he would later describe as a hippie boy. Norio told Anada that he was looking for Lieutenant Onada, a Panda and the abominable snowman in that order. The two men talked for some time and Suzuki attempted to convince Anada to surrender and return home. But Suzuki was unwilling to do so without shouldn't that be Anada was unwilling to do so without a order from a superior officer? No, his name is O N O D A. That's if it's ever spelled different in there, that's my fault. But well, yeah, but you said the two men talked for some time, and Suzuki attempted to convince Onada to surrender and return home. But, oh yeah, it should be Onada, not Suzuki. But Onada was unwilling to do so without orders from a superior officer. Suzuki took several photos of himself with Onada, and when he returned to Japan. He went to the Japanese military with these pictures as proof of his meeting. History does not record whether Norio Suzuki 
ever found a panda or the abominable snowman. <laughs> the Japanese government then located Inada's commanding officer, Major Yoshimi Taniguchi, who by this point had long since surrendered, retired, and become a bookseller. In March of 1974, Tanganuchi went to the mountains of Lubang and officially gave Inada the order to surrender. In doing so, Kunachi fulfilled a promise that he had made in 1944. Whatever happens, we will return for you. Despite his attacks on the local populace on Lubang Island, Island and other misgivings, he was welcomed home as a hero. Many urged him to run for a seat in Japan's bicameral legislation. I think it's bicameral. Bicameral? Yeah. Which I think means two houses, like mm -hmm. like ours. Okay. Basically, they wanted to run for the Japanese House or the Japanese Senate. Cool. He wrote a book about his experiences in the Philippines, and the government offered him a large sum of, sum of money in back pay, which he refused. When well-wishers pressed money on him, he donated to a shrine founded in founded to honor those who had served in Japan. However, he was unhappy and didn't like what he saw as a withering of traditional Japanese values. He moved to Bueno, uh, Buenos, bueno, oh. Buenos, it, it is Buenos, I left Buenos out the... Buenos Aires to the Jamek colony a Japanese-speaking enclave. There he farmed cattle and eventually married. Upon reading about an 18-year-old Japanese boy who murdered his parents in 1980, Anato returned to Japan in 1984 to found the Anato Nature School Education Camp. He held at different locations around Japan. He was eventually pardoned for his crimes in the Philippines by Ferdinand Marcos. Eventually, he passed away in 2016 of heart failure, resulting from a case of pneumonia. From 1922 to 1964. 74. To 2016. Wow. Oh, yeah. He lived almost 100 years. And it, from what I can tell, he was pretty active for That's most why. of it. Uh, because until his death, he would return to Buenos Aires every three months to check on his farm. Wow. And, and I mean, Buenos Aires, like, really treated him like a star. They gave, they eventually named him a civilian, uh, or a citizen, a citizen. They, they gave wow. him a citizenship and they gave him a few other awards. He used to let their Air Force practice on his land. So, yeah, I mean, he was an interesting guy, and I think he's the guy everybody thinks of, because I every week, uh, and if you listen, you know this, every week I put out on social media uh, a picture, so our, our, uh, our fans can guess what the episode is about, sure. which is silly, because we always tell them, but I, you know, it, it's a way to interact. It's a way to interact. And... This week, a lot of people are like, ooh, is it that one guy that was, you know, in Japan forever and held out forever? And and I, I told them that they were close yeah. because that's the rumor or, or that's the thing is a lot of people believe it was just one guy. Right. And it wasn't. And, and the guy I think they're thinking of is this guy. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Hero. 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 I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, and, and he wasn't even the last one to surrender. Right. So that brings us to our final one. Uh, not as long as, as yours, unfortunately. Um, but. More like thankfully, my goodness, that was crazy. <laughs> uh, now we come to Shinsuke Nakamura. Oh, wait, no, no. wrong Nakamura. No. Uh, 
Teruo Nakamura. Uh, that was all. It was awesome. I know. Uh, no. Sir, listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth. I do, Krista, but at the same time... No, you're not listening. You're not even comprehending anything I'm saying. Right you said it was awful. Staring, I heard you're you. staring at me, and you're not comprehending the words. You're just looking at my face. <laughs> What's your issue with my face, man? Huh? Why are you, why you keep looking at it? Because you're my daughter, and you're beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah, that's why you're not comprehending nothing. You're just, you're listening just to the words. Dropped by your you're, beauty. You're listening to the words coming out of my mouth and it's going, whoop, one ear out the other. Talk about Shinsuke before I beat you. It's not Shinsuke. <laughs> not the more. <laughs> Teruo. Don't leave out Krista because she dropped the F on Yes. Teruo Nakamura. Uh, and he was an Amos, or, and I may be mispronouncing that horribly, Aborigine. Uh, the Amos are an indigenous culture of Taiwan. His birth name was Atun Palalan, and he was born. Huh? I said to say that. He was born on October 8th of 1919. In 1943, he enlisted in the Takasugo Volunteer Unit of the Imperial Japanese Army, a unit comprised of indigenous Taiwanese people. He was stationed on Morotai Island in the Dutch East Indies. Not long afterwards, the Allies overran that island in the September 1944 Battle of Morotai. Allegedly, the Japanese army declared him dead in November of 44. Uh, if this is true, it almost certainly had a lot to do with the fact that Teruo was not ethnically Japanese. Uh, Teruo remained there well into the 1950s with other stragglers, though he would set out for ex extended periods of time on his own. In 1956, for reasons unknown, he broke ties with the other stragglers and set up a solitary camp consisting of a small hut in a small fenced field. And this is what I don't understand. Who fenced in the field and why? Because it sounds... It, it, he moves there in what? 56. I, I'm going to... Spoiler alert. He's not found until 74. Who didn't go check that field for 20 years? Why did they fence it off in the first place? I think that would, would make it into history, but I, you could yeah, be right. You know, not some broke, pathetic farm that nobody cared about. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Yeah, very much. Peed in his neighbor's troughs or something. Maybe he was a jerk. And everybody was like, yeah, thank goodness. Who's so, been knocking that old grouchy farmer from down the way who, you know... Who's on your Sakura tree? Thank goodness he's not around anymore. Where'd he go? Dude, I don't know, but I'm just glad he's not here. Kind of thing, you know. Could be. So, for almost the next 20 years, he lived undisturbed in his makeshift home. In mid-1974, a pilot accidentally discovered Nakamura's hut and reported it. In November, the Japanese embassy in Jakarta asked the Indonesian military for help locating the hut and its occupant. Thus, Nakamura was arrested by the Indonesian military without incident on December 18, 1974. He was taken to a hospital in Jakarta to recuperate. Uh, on the 27th, Japan re uh, that would be see December 27th, Japan received news of his discovery. Meanwhile, Teruo chose to repatriate to Taiwan, bypassing Japan altogether. The Chinese national government of Taiwan did not initially trust Nakamura, seeing him as a Japanese loyalist. 
The Japanese, on the other hand, were almost embarrassed by the whole ordeal. Unlike Hiru, uh, who had been discovered earlier that year, Nakamura was not an officer and not ethnically Japanese. Uh, as a private in a colonial unit on a foreign soil, Nakamura was not entitled to a pension due to a change of laws for in the 1950s. So all Nakamura received was a little over $220 worth of back pay. This caused considerable, considerable scorn in the Taiwanese press, and the government and the public donated what would today be the equivalent of $84,000 U.S., just five years after he repatriated to Taiwan, Nakamura passed away of lung cancer on June 15th, 1979. He breaks my heart a little bit because he reminds me of no matter how much uh, I, I love the, the history and the art and the beauty and the culture of Japan, there are things that I don't like about it. And one of those things is that Historically, they have been a very purist culture. You are either purely Japanese or you ain't worth squat. And while that is changing, um, it is the young people who are trying to change it, and it is the old guard who are kind of trying to maintain it. So Japan has a very kind of schizoid split, kind of like we do in this country, so, yeah, and, and, and it's over not the same issues, but similar ones. Uh, but anyway, so there's not as lo a, a lot about this guy. And that could be because, again, he wasn't Japanese, so nobody was seeking him out to find his story. He just seems to have kind of gotten lucky. Like, uh, I mean, there's nothing to his story. Clearly, Shoichi uh, was fighting because when those two men found him, he fought them. If he may have only been fighting out of fear, but he was still fighting. Uh, Hiro, on the other hand, like his government had some misgivings about bringing him home because he'd killed people since the war. Mind you, he thought it was still going on, and he thought he was doing his job, and he was never given the order to stop, you know, which I could see that as being uh, important why he didn't surrender and go home uh, when uh, Suzuki found him. Because if he had surrendered and gone home, then those men in his mind, maybe they become murdered. Whereas if he waits for somebody from the government to go, my order is for you to surrender. Then there are war criminal. Then there are war killings. Sure. And and that I mean I don't know, but I know if I could find a way to compartmentalize that, I sure would. Yeah. So, it, but like I said, I should like this guy more because he wasn't ethnically Japanese. He's living in a place that the Japanese controlled at the time of his birth. So he had a lot of pro-Japanese propaganda shoved down his throat, uh, enough to join a volunteer unit. Uh, and if, if we don't know for sure, but if Japan did declare him dead in November 1944, it's because they didn't bother to look very hard. You know, uh, and... Okay, also, the Americans were occupying the island for a while, and uh, they weren't going to give it back just because the Japanese asked nicely. Right. So, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, we just want to look for a couple guys. Yeah, no. What do they look like? <laughs> so, but... Uh, I, for me, I like Shoichi the best, because... <laughs> He's just so nice, I guess. Hero has edges, you know. Uh, but Shoichi was nice, and Naka and and Nakamura, other than his name, I, I just don't. I just don't have it. Like like I said, it just feels like he got lucky. Like if that pilot had had a you know, you know some turbulence or something and veered twenty degrees off course. He would have died there five years later. Yeah. And, and we wouldn't know about him. So, sure. 
Uh, it, I guess it's just like. I mean, but the wife in general tends to be a lot of that too. So. Yeah, I, that's fair. I, I just, I don't know. I just can't get behind him as much as I would like to. Uh, like I said, I know he should be my favorite, but uh, I think I'm going to go with Shoichi just because Shoichi just seemed so calm and quiet. Like he was ready to be done. I don't know that I have a favorite, but I don't know fortunately you... I've never had to be a soldier and I've never had to fight in a war and I, I just, I know everyone does things for the reason that they do things and I just have to have my peace with that. For me, I don't know that you have to absolutely have a person that you stand with. And you don't absolutely have to be like, oh yeah, this person, exactly what I would have done. No, because everybody does their own thing. Everybody has things that they disagree with. Everybody, they are different people. Some people protest silently, or not silently, but some people protest, some people actually fight. It's all about what you you do in specific. I think. Yeah, it. I, I see your point. I, I definitely see your point. And one of the things about uh, Hero that I just kind of admire is when he surrendered. He was given the order to surrender, and when he surrendered, he turned over his sword. He had a samurai sword. Mm -hmm. Because he was an officer, he turned over a dagger his mom had given given him to kill himself in case he was overrun by the Allies, and, and so he turned that over. And he turned over his still working rifle and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. Like this guy, if I needed someone to like organize, he would be my guy. <laughs> Because I would be, like, I'd be video gaming that, that ammunition. Uh, I'm so hungry. There's a cow. Bah, 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 bah. You wasted 100 rounds. Yeah, but that cow is dead. We're having steaks. You're a mess. Eh, maybe. Probably. You're our mess, though. Any other thoughts, Krista? Not really, no. I think that brings us to the end. That does. And that is our show. Uh, thanks, as always, for listening. If you would like to discuss this topic some more, please join the Family Plot uh, Facebook group. It's a great place to discuss our topics or suggest topics for future shows. Uh, thanks to Bill Barrett for our theme music. Uh, Bill's last name is spelled B-E-H-R-E-N-D-T. Uh, you can reach him at Bar Bill Barrett at sbcglobal.net. Uh, you can also catch him on the Rusty and Dusty show, uh, which hopefully will be resum resuming soon. Soon. <sighs> uh, also, thanks to uh, Paige Elmore of Reverie True Crime. One, she does a heck of a true crime podcast. Two, uh, she her canvas skills to, to combined with our Krista's artwork to make our logo art. So, thank you, Paige. Thank you, Paige. Also, thanks to Aaron Gnurk of the Big Dumb Fun Show. Uh, Join us next week as we look into the Valeska Axe Murder House. Uh, so we're going Old West True Crime, kind of. Bye! Bye. Bye.